welcome all to Spotlight Sessions, where we shine a light on incredible individuals and organizations and the work that they do. I am your host, Josh Basil. I'm a C45 quadriplegic, paralyzed below my shoulders, and a power wheelchair user. I'm the Community Relations Manager at Accessory and a passionate disability rights advocate and attorney focused on breaking down barriers for people with disabilities. Today on Accessory's Spotlight Sessions, we are joined by Judy Human. She is an international disability rights advocate and founder of Judith Human LLC. Welcome, Judy. Well, Great our... to be with you, Josh. If I could explain, so I am a white 74-year-old post-polio quadriplegic. I use a motorized wheelchair. I'm wearing uh, red glasses. My hair is brown and goes is shoulder length. I'm wearing uh, pearl earrings and a purple uh, top and pictures in the foyer that we're in. And as I just mentioned, we're in a, our foyer. We don't have a separate room like you do for recording. So you will see people coming behind me. Because I, I love that you did that. And lab. can you tell our viewers why you went in a greater detail, sharing, painting a picture? So people who are blind or low vision may not know what we look like and what we're wearing. And so I think over the last number of years, it's become much more common for people to describe themselves. And I think that's really great because it's also interesting to describe yourself and see how people describe themselves. Uh, you know, th thank really you for great. doing that. And all right, so I would love to let our audience know, tell us a little bit more about the work and initiatives that are going on at Judith Human LLC. So my background is I had my disability in 1949 and I was really thrown into advocacy work. I was only 18 months old, but gradually as I got older and my parents were also experiencing discrimination, like not being able to get me registered for school because the principal said I was a fire hazard. Advocacy is something that just really came about naturally. And I've had the privilege over my life to work in areas that I never fathomed I would be able to be involved with. So I've worked in the nonprofit sector for like 20 years plus and then I worked in government. I worked in the Clinton administration. I worked at the World Bank. I worked for the mayor of DC and I worked for the Obama administration. And since 2017, I've been with my company. Now, the reason I give you the background information is because I have done a lot of work both in the nonprofit world, which means that I I've worked with people of all kinds of disabilities. I was one of the uh, founders of the Berkeley Center for Independent Living, which really now is all across the United States and around the world, working with great disability rights leaders, very involved. And if you watch a film called Crip Camp, you'll see work that I and many other people have done to advance the rights of disabled people. I've done a lot of work on policy. I was one of the founders of the World Institute on Disability, which was really the first disabled run public policy institute. And then my work in the Department of Education at the State Department and with the World Bank. So I do a bunch of different things on a day-to-day -day basis. I do a lot of public speaking. In the last couple of years, I've been doing it on Zoom. My first book came out, my memoir with Kristen, Joyner came out in January, February of 2020, just around the time of the pandemic. And then a young adult version came out in June of 2021. So, and then I do this program, as you know, called The Human Perspective, which is a podcast. And I hope that people can go look at it or listen to it. Um, we interview people with all kinds of disabilities. 
Me so uh, you're, all the I, I love your journey and everything that you've done. And mm. I feel like Crip Camp, which is the Netflix documentary, which I highly recommend everybody to watch. It's been life changing, being able to dive into your journey and everything you've done to change the world. And to tell you the truth, my, my disability occurred when I was 18 years old in 2004. And I don't think my life would be what it is today without all of the work that you did and have done with so many other disability advocates across the country. So if you could summarize, what is the story of Crip Camp? So the story of Crip Camp, uh, it starts out at a, a Camp Junaid, which was in Hunter, New York, not far from Woodstock. And it was a camp for basically young adults and adults who had disabilities. And the reason why there was a segregated camp, and there were many of them, uh, was that people with more significant uh, disabilities were not able to go to the regular camps because they weren't accessible. And it allows the audience to see the issues that disabled campers, and I was in administration at that point, some of the issues that we were dealing with and both having fun and having serious discussions. Then the projection of the film goes from 1970 with this amazing footage of the camp, basically into the 21st century to about 2016, 17. So the audience gets a very good understanding of some significant issues that were being addressed. One, organizing two, organizing cross-disability, three, focusing in on a couple of major pieces of legislation, one being Section 504, uh, which was one of the first pieces of legislation making it illegal to discriminate against a disabled person if they were receiving money from the federal government. And then another big aspect of the film, uh, it, relates to the Americans with Disabilities Act. So really by watching this film, I believe you are very much drawn into getting a quick history, but I think a pretty significant uh, piece of information that allows you both to feel and learn from disabled people with all kinds of disabilities about what our day-to-day -day lives were like, both positive and negative and what we were doing and still do what we were doing then to really we're breaking down barriers, fighting for equality, creating better futures for just millions of Americans and setting the stage for the world also to learn. I mean, I think another, sorry, but another important part about the film, Josh, is it really resonates with disabled people all around the world. And as work was going on, for example, in the 1970s, when I was working at the Berkeley Center for Independent Living, there would be people that would be coming from all over the United States to learn about what CIL was. But we also had people coming from other parts of the world, from Africa, from Europe, from Asia. The Japanese, as a, a piece of information, uh, they have a business I like Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, it's called Mr. Donut. And uh, the company sent 10 disabled people a year to the United States for 10 years uh, to learn That's about awesome. Centers for Independent Living. So you can see that there were some amazing investments in work that we were doing. And actually today, in Japan, I think there's like 150 or 170 centers for independent living uh, across Japan, but they've also helped set up independent living centers in different parts of Asia. That's so awesome. And in Costa Rica. So other than giving incredible TED Talks and being on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, tell us more about Judith Human LLC, the work that you're doing and the different initiatives you have going on. Well, I think one other important part about my life is my husband and our families. And somehow that doesn't necessarily get discussed a lot, but um, 
you know, for me, I work more than 24 seven, but, um, you know, my husband's family, my family, they're really wonderful. We don't live near each other. So a lot of what we're doing is on the phone or over zoom or from time to time getting together. But I do think that families are very important and maybe part of my work has really been influenced by both of our commitment to stay in touch with family and make sure that they know we're there for them. And by that, I mean, networking for, for me is very important. Meeting people like yourself um, who are doing really great work. I'll talk to somebody else who's doing similar work and I'll say, oh, you know, do you know Josh? This way you should know him. And I give information and I love to do that. I think it's a skill that people kind of laugh at. People will call me and say that I've got the best listing of people and phone numbers and emails of most people. So what are we doing? As I was saying, we're doing a lot of presentations that are anything from big companies like PayPal and Amazon and others to presenting with elementary school children, kindergarten, first, second, middle school, high school, lots of universities. I'm doing work with UCLA. They applied for me to be a lecturer and it's through the region. So it's competitive. And so I'll be doing that with them in the beginning of February. And I do work with religious groups, book clubs. People are wanting to learn more about the movie and the book. But for me, just one thing that's very important is I'm trying to allow people to understand the importance looking at disability as a natural part of life. And the reason I believe it's very important is, for example, as people are getting older, in their 30s and 40s and getting older, I want them to start realizing that they need to think about their future. Do they want to stay in the home that they're living in? Do they want to live in a segregated nursing home? What choices do they want and what could they be doing today to really enable them to be looking at a future which they're more in control of? Issues that you and I deal with all the time, like around personal assistance. So I'm on a number of boards of directors. I'm on the board of the American Association of People with Disabilities, Human Rights Watch, which is an amazing international organization, um, Humanity and Inclusion, which is another international organization that focuses on disability, the United States International Council on Disability, and the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. So the boards that I'm on really are significantly international with some national. And then I'm also doing work on media. I was a senior fellow at the Ford Foundation in 2017 till the beginning of 2019. And what I was doing for my fellowship was looking at representation or lack thereof of disabled people in media and did a paper which people can look at, come to our website, uh, which is judithhuman.com and uh, get a lot of this information. But I think I'm an influencer and I love to be an influencer with many, many other people. I, I, I love everything that you're doing. I don't know how you have all the hours in the day to, to go after all these things and be a part of all these. And I, I love that you were mentioning before that you talked to elementary students. And I, I would love for you to share your story about what it was like, the barriers you faced at first to become, to communicate with elementary students in the first place uh, as a teacher. Could you share that story? Sure. So I have never walked independently. Um, I used to use braces 
and crutches, but I couldn't stand up. I couldn't sit down myself. It would take me like 20 minutes to walk across the room. That backdrop is important. So I've used a wheelchair and started using a motorized wheelchair in the uh, latter part of the 1960s. And I wanted to be a teacher. My friends in high school said, don't tell the agency that's going to help you pay for college because they will want you to show them one or more teachers who got their licenses using a wheelchair. And I didn't know anybody and my friends didn't know anybody. So I majored in speech and theater, which was something I was interested in. And I minored in education. I took all the courses that I needed to. There were three exams. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I live in Washington, DC now. I took all the required tests, the written test, an oral test, and a medical exam. All three of them were offered in buildings that had steps, not a step or two steps, but flights of steps. And my friends had to help me in and out of those buildings. When I took my medical exam, I had a doctor who was uh, difficult to describe this particular doctor, but she asked me all kinds of questions that were completely inappropriate. She was just supposed to be asking me questions about my medical, was my blood pressure good, all these things, which of course it was. But she got into asking me things like, could I show her how I went to the bathroom? Imagine what one would feel like at the age of 21, 22, where someone was asking you to show them how you go to the bathroom. When she said that, I remember thinking, I can't believe this is happening. I'm not going to cry. That was like the big message to myself. And I said, if other teachers have to show their children how to go to the bathroom, I will do that. And then she told me I had to come back for another medical exam that I needed to bring my braces and my crutches, which at that point I wasn't using. At that point, I wasn't using any crutches or braces, just my wheelchair. And I had to go back for a second interview. And the reason I was denied my license was in writing paralysis of both lower extremities, sequelae of poliomyelitis. So I was very fortunate. I found an attorney, two attorneys to represent me pro bono. And then we went to court, federal court, and the judge was the first black woman to serve on the federal bench, Constance Baker Motley. She gets to and she <laughs> She gets discrimination. And she strongly encouraged the Board of Ed to give me another medical exam, which they did in the same inaccessible building. But this time it was a different doctor. And this doctor was much younger. Remember that this was before Section 504. It was before the Americans with Disabilities Act. It was in 1970. And the new doctor was very embarrassed and basically said, I'm so sorry, you've had to go through this and approve me. And I got a job, I taught for three years and I taught um, in elementary school. And uh, one year I taught, well, for two years, I taught uh, second graders. The first year I taught kids across That's, elementary school. I love that story and just becoming, it was the first female or first teacher, a uh, wheelchair user within New York City to be able to break that barrier. Yeah, and of course I had no idea that that would be the case, but it was. And I think that experience of working with young children was great. And I think it allows me, uh, with having discussions about my book, my disability, um, to relate. So many of our viewers are business owners. I would love to know if you had one message to share with business owners, what would that be? 
about disability. Don't be afraid of it, either personally or professionally. Look at us as a customer base that you don't want to throw away and get to know people, talk to people. And I think equally importantly, um, ask both employees and customers about how you're doing and what more would be beneficial to improve the work that they're That's doing. That's a great message. And it's one that, um, you know, businesses just being able to tap into this untapped market of millions of people that exist with disabilities in the U.S. and the amazing spending power that we have to be able to be a part of their business journey as well. Just being welcomed just opens the doors to so many opportunities and collaborations and just a more inclusive world. So Judy, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being for our Accessibility Spotlight session guest today and for sharing your story and sharing your story with our viewers. You're amazing. And just thank you, Judy, so much. Thank you. I'm so glad we're doing this. And I'll have I cannot you wait for that. Soon. So take care, everyone. And until next time. Thank you.